Hi, I'm Jeff Davis. Today's tales are born from the renowned fertile region called Russian River Valley in Sonoma County, California. Recent studies have indicated this American viticultural area has more diversity in its approximately 225 square miles than any other place in the world. For example, there are more soil types in Russian River Valley than the entire country of France. As you'll hear, it's been called the Garden of Eden and is possibly the best climate to grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It has led to cult wines and vineyards of which wine writers cannot say enough. If an elegantly crafted Pinot Noir exploding with rich flavor is one of your favorites, you'll want to join me on the wine road. And it was growers designate because it was the grower's choice. Right. He got to choose in the morning what clones we were picking and he'd put them in the bin and sometimes I'd get phone calls at 4 a.m. Amy, get up, you're getting fruit. <laughs> There's no room for massive ego or narcissism or any of this weird stuff. All we're doing is fermenting grapes, man, and putting a label on it. But um, we do all take what we do very seriously down to the pinpoint. My guests today have a history together. Charlie Chenoweth grows sought-after Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and Charlie's wife Amy and friend Michael Brown use his grapes to craft their own versions of epic wines. Michael sourced his grapes from the Chenoweth's highly regarded Treehouse and Bootleggers Hill vineyards for his previous Costa Brown cult wines, then later in his family brand, Cirque. He continues to source grapes from the Chenoweth's as well as other vineyards in the Russian River Valley for his newly released brand, Chev a project that was inspired by the crafting talents of his father. We'll touch upon that brand and his new autobiography later in the podcast. Getting back to the Chenoweths, these two epitomize the down-home, welcoming nature of western Sonoma County and possess deep roots in the region with Charlie's family's 170-year history. Of the two, Amy's the wild one, Charlie's a bit subdued. And as I mentioned, his family's been here a long time. Yep, we came here in 1847. And you still have a lot of the original homes and structures on the property from the early 20th century. Yeah, yeah. The ranch house and the chicken coop and the, some of the barns, yeah. And you say chicken coop, but it's been refurbished and someone's living in there now. Yeah, it's a really nice chicken coop. <laughs> And Amy, the family's been here about 170 years, so you've been making wine for like, what, 40, 50 years now? <laughs> I think it's been five years. <laughs> not 40 years. I'm not even that old yet. <laughs> I must have been joking then. What a great situation you have. Your husband is a vineyard manager on the property here. You have some iconic vineyards that have been used by many people, including Costa Brown and Patson Hall and others. And you started making wine a little while back, but uh, you both started as uh, garage yeasts, huh? Oh, absolutely. From the minute that I had met Charlie, we he was in the wine business, so to speak. He was working for Dutton Ranch when we met, and we would get grapes and make wine in the literally in the garage we were the original garage yeasts out here uh, and all kinds of different varietals too charlie actually one time made a 100 percent stainless steel chardonnay mm. in a friend's garage and it was one of the best chardonnays i've ever had really really good i'd like to probably do that again someday how fortunate is amy to have a husband who's the wine grower and vineyard manager overlooking vines on their property that produce exceptional fruit. And no one knows those vines better than Charlie. Yeah, yeah, my, my kids would say, eat more grapes at harvest than the birds. So mm, yeah. well, that's how I know when to pick it. <laughs> it was fun uh, to listen to you talk about the vineyards, and your website says you're fanatical about your vineyard process. Why don't you describe what you do differently than a lot of folks? I uh, pay a lot of attention to uh, to how we tie things and what products we use to tie vines. Um, like I said, we use a dowel rod when we do cane pruning, so there's no girdling. And then in uh, Cordon, we use a, a loose twine, uh, all organic, and uh, don't have any. I don't like green tie tape. I'll never use it. Um, and then kind of trend-setted uh, scissor pruning or harvesting. Um, never used knives harvesting pinot. Scissors only. Um, and then we were probably one of the first ones too that started doing uh, night picking too. 
Uh, so it's like taking fruit from a refrigerator and it has more time and it gives the wineries. Wineries, literally in the 90s and things, we would always pick through the day, give their fruit to them at four and five in the afternoon. They'd work through the night, right? Well, they, I don't know if they did that on purpose, but they swapped the role for us. So now we pick at night, we give them the fruit first thing in the morning and they're able to process th- during yeah. the day. But you got to understand like a, 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 a colored grape, you know, in the in the sunlight, it gets extremely hot. Uh, there's a lot more chance for for you know problems with that. If the the fruit is cold, and then this area is being one of the best growing regions in the world, it, we have here 40 to 50 degree temperature swings from night to day. So when we're picking fruit in the 40s and putting it in bins and then taking it to the winery first thing in the morning, it's a far superior product. Right. So, and how you handle your cover crop is unique as well. Yeah, I, I started that a long time ago. Um, and actually, I picked it up from Amigo Bob, which is was an organic farmer, which I I, uh, I looked up to and uh, kind of tweaked it a little bit. And Labalisters used to call it Channel with Mix, um, but that's really critical to flavor and, and control of uh, of uh, the goodness in the vineyard. So it uh, adopted your name, huh? The Channel with Mix. Yeah, for a long time it did, but I think now they call it something. Now, did you tell me you have a, a clone that's more or less named after you as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah. What is that? It's just a Pinot Noir grape. Huh. Yeah, I couldn't tell you much about it. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's very different. If you went out at harvest and ate the grape and checked out the grape, it, uh, it's pretty unique. Tell me about the clones you have growing here on your various vineyards. Uh, you've got quite a few of them. Yeah, the home ranch uh, that goes to Patson Hall is uh, 115, 667, and 777. Um, pretty typical for the planting time of the late nineties and early two thousands. Um, everybody was planting Dijon, but at that time I, I felt the gut reaction of throwing swans, pomards, other things in there, um, always with the Dijons. And then when I planted treehouse vineyard, I, uh, I went with all heritage clones. So there I have, uh, the CC, which can, can't tell you about that one, but then there's uh 37, which is Mount Eden. And we have Swan. Uh, and then we have 23, with, which is the Swiss Wadensville. And then, of course, we have mm-hmm. Pomard and Calera. Yeah. Uh, the 23, I, I'm pretty sure I had never heard of that one before. Yeah, not many people have heard about it, except now I've, I've, I guess I pushed it quite a bit to winemakers. And they like it. And I've, I've, I've pointed out the characteristics of it and it being the only Pinot Noir clone that has both blue-black color tone. I saw that vineyard but did not see those colors because at the time the grapes were going through verasion, changing from green to purple or black. Sounds pretty interesting, though. At this point, I said to Amy, I really enjoyed the fruit forwardness of the home ranch, and the bootleggers hill has the same quality. But the treehouse vineyard seemed to be more complex, and I really enjoyed the flavor of that Pinot Noir. Yeah, absolutely. The treehouse vineyard did brings flavors that you we don't get in other vineyards around here and I think it's the soil it's also the clones so the clones are a little different there than they are at home ranch and bootleggers which are the traditional Dijon clones at home ranch and bootleggers in treehouse the heritage clones Calera, Pomard, Swan and 23 we don't have those clones in the other vineyards the other ones that so you get, and from the soil as well, you get a minerality that you don't get. Yeah. So the soil at Treehouse is that iron rich, right. red. Nice, deep red color. Yeah, really red. Really red. And it's weird that it's just right on that knoll, too. So the mm. vineyard on, right on the other side of the fence line has the typical Franciscan soil, right? The, that no, no, uh, too, gold ridge, yeah, I mean. Right. And uh, it's just right on that knoll where Treehouse Vineyard is. And so it's very, very unique <clears throat> vineyard there. You can spot those cl- that soil type in other areas in the county, um, but uh, they don't have the same characteristics as uh-huh. that. So. And you have, what is it, two, three, or four beautiful tall trees right. right there on the top of that knoll. Right in the middle of that vineyard. Yeah, yeah. we'd love to put a treehouse in there someday. A real treehouse. Wow. <laughs> And from what I saw and heard, Charlie will likely build a treehouse. There were about five projects that were pointed out to us, which were underway. And at the time, that included their new tasting room. Oops, wait, that's not the right name. The Tasting Shack. Tasting Shack. Tasting Shack. We'll be able to greet people there and then uh, 
chase her and then put them in the go buggies and send them up the hill. The go buggies. The go buggies. <laughs> I should mention this interview was recorded in August of last year. I waited to air the interview because Charlie hadn't completed the new tasting shack. Then the winter months arrived, followed by the season of COVID-19, which lingers. But Chenoweth, as of this July, is now welcoming guests back to the property in their incredible Redwood Grove. It's a huge, wide-open space where they've held weddings in the past. It's an impressive location to enjoy their equally impressive Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Rosé. It's a great life they have, living out among the Redwoods and the hills west of Sebastopol. Now, Amy is going to tell us about the wines she so lovingly crafts. The Syrah that we sourced for our our rosé is a vineyard that he picked up as a lease up in Dry Creek. Uh, We just grafted that over to Grenache. Pretty excited about that. I love a Grenache rosé. Then, let's see, we do Pinot Noirs. Until 2016, we only did the one Pinot Noir. We took all three of our estate Pinot vineyards and blended them into one grower's designate. And it was grower's designate because it was the grower's choice. Right. He got to choose in the morning what clones we were picking, and he'd put them in the bin. And sometimes I'd get phone calls at 4 a.m. Amy, get up. You're getting fruit. <laughs> <laughs> And you were out there and you were tasting, uh, you said you pulled grapes off and you just decided, all right, this is ready to go. Yeah, yeah, when I'm picking for my friends, James Hall or or uh, Costa Brown and things, um, I'm always eating the grapes because we, we can have fruit from these vineyards. So yeah, sure. as they pay, I don't, I typically won't make a picking call on my own. I, as a grower, I'm waiting for them to, to make their call first and then I'll pull ours out of it at the same time. Um, we have saved some um, and held it later after picking a little bit for ourselves. But typically I'll pick when James Hall says the pick or in the day of uh, most of the years that we've had this uh, partnership. It was Michael Brown. And then lately now it, it was Nico for a while and now uh, uh, Julian for Costa Brown. So. And you would taste several of the different vineyards and think, okay, this is going to make a really good blend this year. And that yeah. was what became the, the grower's blend. Correct. Yeah, I, I I have really never held to one spot. I typically run around and go ahead of the crew and eat grapes and kind of look in an area that I want to throw my bin in and get my fruit from that area. So uh, don't tell the winemakers, but I'm cherry picking. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a good chance they're listening to this show. <laughs> That's <what> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> And as we're going to hear later in this hour, my previous conversation with Michael Brown, I mean, he just uh, loves your treehouse and Bootleggers Hill uh, vineyards. Yes, yes, he does. He's sourced from there when he was with Costa Brown and previously with Cirque as well. Mm. Yeah, they're unique vineyards, both of them. I have a gut, gut feeling about where a good site is. I can walk onto a piece of property and just kind of look around and... And then I'll visit it and think about it, and I'll keep looking and see where the shadows are or where the sun's hitting. And you know, a lot of vineyards now we put off a compass in the inland areas. Uh, it has to be about 28 degrees off north south, and that puts the hottest point of the day directly on top of the canopy. It doesn't strike the fruit from either side. Mm. So even on a rectangular block, instead of end posts on one end and just the other, we'll put end posts all the way around it because I went and kicked the darn rows in at an angle. So very expensive, but uh, worth it in the long run uh, for high-quality fruit. And then out in the Freestone, I, w- I w- had the privilege to plant Kistler's first vineyard in Freestone, mm-hmm. and I did Benzinger's Biodynamic Vineyard out there. And I also had the privilege to, to learn a lot from them um, and uh, started doing spacing at, at 40 by seven foot so i I do 40 inches because it's america so i threw the meter thing out the door and i just went 40 inches and then by seven foot so um but that's a great spacing for the guillo that we like to to, uh, prune to and and cane pruning Mm -hmm. um and we'll still do that same spacing for cordon also your uh, grandfather grew cherries your father grew gravenstein apples with cherries as well and then you you got to pull out the cherries with dynamite, I understand. Yeah. That's a story. Yep. Yeah, Dad Dad gave me a case of dynamite and said, blow blow the cherry trees out, which gives them a, actually it fractions the soil super well, blows the cherry tree out, sure. fractions the soil, puts nitrogen in the ground, and it's an awesome, perfect hole to plant a new tree. And you were how old? Twelve. By myself. So I had electrical caps, 
He told me to be careful. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> he told me to only use a half a stick. Well, when nobody was looking, I used a few more than that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the tree would fly. So it was wow. pretty cool. You have all your fingers. I do, yeah. <laughs> ah, the old days of farming in rural Northern California. At least I don't think that kind of explosive clearing is going on much these days. They're Charlie and Amy Chenoweth of Chenoweth Wines outside of Sebastopol, Sonoma County. I asked Charlie at this point when they planted the first grapevines on his family's old property. Uh, the, the vineyards here on the property I planted in are uh, 98, 99, right in there. You know, the history we've been here, we had grapes before Prohibition, um, and then we've always farmed. So we were in uh, timber, and then whenever we had some areas that we thought we could grow something, uh, we would we would plant something. So. Yeah, so you've been at it for so long, no wonder that you know these vineyards so well, and the aspect of the sun and the slope and what part of the, the vineyard is facing the sun and all that. Yeah, yeah, I've... I've uh... I use common sense, and not many people have that anymore, it seems. But, uh, yeah, I farm proactively and with a lot of thought. So no wonder when you put together the grower's designate, uh, you're pretty confident, and you've been happy with what Amy's yeah, been producing over the years? Yeah, and then when we do the grower's designate, it's three separate vineyards, all different um, aspects and, and uh, conditions, and, uh, and, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So. And now you're doing a lot more vineyard designate wines. Yes, now we've we are still doing our growers designate uh, with each vintage, but now we are also have our vineyard designates. So we have a home ranch, a treehouse, and bootleggers, Pinot Noirs. Those we just released with our 2016 release uh, this last July, and they're really beautiful. And all three of them are very different too. Mm. So and yeah. you can taste the components when you do taste the the growers designate as well the, yeah and on, on those we uh we had my brother hand sketch all the the labels for uh for yeah. and then uh, we used the uh, 1870s uh cattle brand on everything so you still have that brand i do yes yeah that's nice yeah wow. we brand barrels and things with it um and then we've like used that. the font and everything on our label so Again, what a history you have here. It's amazing what you have to work with that many people don't have at their disposal. Yeah, the, absolutely. I mean, the the opportunities that we were that we have here with the with the history. And then, you know, Charlie's what I call is garbage collection, but it's really all the history of Sonoma County, really, not just the Chenoweth history, but there's we've got this old grader out here that's a 1800s grader and it's Art, really, at this point, right? Not garbage, right? <laughs> at a turn of the century, uh, wine press, a really unique, neat wine press uh, that I acquired over time uh, through people that I knew. Um, and I just actually sold it to Michael Brown so it could be displayed at Cirque Winery. Oh, nice. Um, because uh, sitting out here on the ranch, I just I was just watching things happen to it and move it here and move it there and show people for a minute, but it just didn't seem to be in the right place. Is that going to be in his backyard by the pool? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's there on the property now. I know he's going to display it. When I visited Michael Brown the other day, who's coming up in the next half hour, I didn't see that wine press because they're going through construction, but I did get a look at a photo of Michael sitting in the press full of harvested grapes with his clothes on. So (laughs) he's enjoying that historic wine press. And you also have quite a history on Slusser Road with Sara Lee's Vineyard. Yeah, I was working for the Duttons. The barn was still a barn. Um, Then there was probably maybe 100 acres planted when I came, and I had planted 300. I farmed over 70 different varieties on that property. Uh, I built all the buildings. I put choo-choo and boxcar bathroom there. Uh, The the Richards Grove was literally poison oak, blackberries, refrigerators, and one dead body. Uh, We had to stop the project um, and have the sheriff's department coroner come out and uh, found found a person that was a transient. They did identify him that died, that they didn't know what happened to him for a long time, but then they, they figured it out. And then we made that the beautiful park that it is. Yeah. And Sarah Lee's Vineyard now is, is iconic. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I really do feel she gave me wings. Uh, I was telling you, I, I made her coffee in the morning, got her paper, and moved her patio furniture at night, and also built all the vineyards and buildings and did a lot for them and still work for Sonoma Grapevines itself 
actually built when the uh, FAO Acrimonium came in, I built the hot water tanks that were down in Bakersfield that I had to go. They flew me down to to check on the stuff that I built, so um, to treat stuff for, for disease. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, a lot of stuff that I've yeah. been involved in. So A lot of history there on the uh, the vineyard and building side, and now, Amy, you're working on the, uh, the winemaking side, and you can do that for many more uh, decades. I hope so. I really enjoy it. I really like doing it. So I hope that many more decades come. <laughs> well, guys, I could go on for another two or three hours about what you have going on here, but uh, we should probably uh, wrap up. But it's definitely a, a place that anybody would get a kick out of seeing. Absolutely. And we invite you to come and see it. All of you. <laughs> Everybody listening. Everybody. <laughs> My wife and I had a great time with Charlie and Amy last August touring the property and the vineyards. Those tours are on hold for now, but as I mentioned earlier, they are offering tastings in their picturesque grove among the tall redwoods. It's a huge clearing and easy to keep a distance from one another. Visit ChenowethWines.com. That's W-E-T-H in Chenoweth. If you love full-flavored wines, you'll appreciate theirs. Now, let's get another take. Michael Brown, formerly of Costa Brown and now Cirque, has a great respect for the grapes Charlie is growing. I've interviewed Michael a couple of times over the years, most recently two years ago. He's a guy who has carved out quite a fascinating life. If you heard the recent interview, you learned he spent time in the circus, performing some challenging acts for a young kid. Later in life, he gained fame in the wine world when he and Dan Costa created the highly sought-after cult wine Costa Brown. He eventually moved on from that partnership to form his own company, Brown Family Wines. The first release was Cirque, hearkening back to his circus days. For that, he chose an early 20th century vintage theme for his labels and branding. It's very cool. We got together recently to talk about that new brand just prior to its release. But first, Michael is a fan and a friend of the Chenoweths. When I met him in 2018, he shared his thoughts about their vineyards. Charlie Chenoweth approached me with a vineyard that was unnamed at that point, became Bootleggers Hill. And um, he said, hey, Michael, this is a great, uh, great property. would love to have you involved with it. And I love Charlie. And I said, let's make it happen. But none of us had, neither of us had any money. But we went for it. And I wanted to have my own brand someday because I knew Costa Brown. I, eventually, I'd be out of Costa Brown. And that was the plan. And so I wanted to have my own vineyard. And it started with Bootleggers. And uh, it was an old apple orchard, and we scraped together money. And the first, um, the first uh, uh, distribution we got from Costa Brown was in '08. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars, which was big money for my wife and I and our family. And we paid off our debt, and we had about a hundred and ten thousand dollars left. And I took a hundred thousand of that and put it into bootleggers, and I didn't tell my wife. <laughs> and I said, "No, don't worry. This will work out. This will work out." So. And it did, and it was a great project, planting that vineyard and, and moving that along. And um, it's called Bootleggers Hill because Charlie's dad, we were talking to him one time, and his family um, has lived in this area since the 1840s. And we were telling him where this vineyard was. At the time, he was probably 81, 82 years old. And he said, yeah, that is where the bootleggers used to come over the hill during Prohibition to bring their wares into Santa Rosa and then to San Francisco. And I said, well, it's Bootleggers Hill then. Perfect. And the name stuck. And it's a really cool vineyard. And then we got into Treehouse, which Charlie planted earlier, and I think in 05. And we became partners in that vineyard and took the lease over in that. And Charlie owns that piece of land. And it's a spectacular vineyard. And then in 11 was our first vintage where we started Cirque production mm-hmm. from Treehouse Vineyard. Because Bootleggers was just planted. Right. And then 13 was the first vintage from Bootleggers. So I'm guessing now Costa Brown's kind of like uh, the beloved family member who has moved away, and now that's passed, and uh, Cirque is your own estate winery. But you're still hanging in the neighborhood. You love this Russian River Valley. Uh, There's nothing like Russian River Valley. To me, this is the Garden of Eden, and everything grows well here. Plants, animals, trees, grass, people. People grow well here, too. That's why I wanted to raise my family here. But you look around, you know, we have rivers and streams and hills and mountains and redwood forests and grapevines and gardens and farms. It's just, it's it's a magical land. 
and we're blessed great, to be here. Great vibe, too. Cool vibe. Very cool vibe, yeah. And good energy around this place, especially in the Russian River Valley in West County. I, I really like it. And all the way to the coast, you know, where the influence of the ocean, not only the cooling influence of vineyards, but just the influence of the power of the ocean. Right? Yeah. It adds a lot of energy to this, to this area, which is really cool. I had some fog this morning on my way over here, and I can see out the front there. It's still hanging in the valleys. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and you love that uh, rich fruit expression that the Russian River Valley Pinot Noir has to offer. I do. Yeah, I do. And I, the textures, you know, I'm a, very, I'm a texture guy and a mouthfeel, when it comes to wine, a mouthfeel guy. And, and, and uh, those, the mouthfeel to me are like sounds, uh, like tones with music. Mm-hmm. Bass tones, mid tones, high tones, different bass tones, different mid tones, different high tones, and we can hit all those in the Russian River Valley uh, with Pinot Noir and other wines. But I'm obviously focused on Pinot Noir. But within that, um, within Pinot Noir, we can hit all those different tones because of the diversity of soils, terroir, climate. It's a, such a diverse region. But it holds its own together with those textures and flavors and just that energy. And we can hit the electricity at the high tone. We can hit the mid kind of a mid cello version of something happening with a with a certain clone or a vineyard or farming practices. And we can hit those bass tones as well. And my goal in a wine is to make sure that all of those are in harmony. Um, and the vintage to me is a piece of music. And then we can you know, add these different vineyards and textures as instruments within that to make a whole sound, if that makes sense. Right. And then you can have a different composition every year. Every year. And that's what I focus on, the vintage. Um, I, I love the sites because they're so individual, but the vintage is what Mother Nature brings is something that, that I cherish and something that is of utmost importance when I look at wines and making wine. I want to express that, and I want to honor that, because that is Mother Nature's fingerprint on it. Yeah, yeah you're very terroir-focused, and uh, I'm going to kind of jump ahead here, but since we're talking about it, uh, you've been doing single vineyards for now, but you're going to start doing something new with your 2017, and which will be released in 2020. Uh, 2021 on, on Cirque, yes. But, yeah, absolutely, and, you know, we did the vineyard designate thing because that was kind of what was being done, mm-hmm. right? And we were following different people doing these different things um, with, with our wines and our branding because we didn't know what we were doing, right? We just said, let's, let's go for somebody. Let, let's look at somebody we think is really cool, and let's kind of try to emulate that in a sense, but still be our own brand, Costa Brown. And it was, it was great, and I learned a lot with that. But within that, each vineyard, I would try to dissect into different components, whether it's whole cluster, clonal differences, early picking, mid picking, late picking, different leafing, you name it, right? I would try to dissect it to have components and then blend those back together in a way that made sense as a balanced wine within, the, again, the context of the sounds. And with, with the 17 vintage of Cirque, I thought, well, why don't I just take a few more vineyards and kind of pick all these, try to, try to make the wines in a way that they can have these different components and then bring them together for a, a, for the most balanced wine I can produce. And it was refreshing because now it's it's complex, but it's refreshing that I just, I'm now I'm just going to make one wine for Cirque with a 17 vintage. And I have a lot of different colors and sounds to deal with to produce that. Yeah. Truly going to be the, the composer and work with the whole symphony. That's a good analogy, yeah, and that's what I'm trying to do because there are so many, just within Pinot Noir alone, there are so many different, um, again, tone, I keep saying tones and colors, but there's so many different tones and colors within that. Mm-hmm. You can see colors on your palette. You can see purple, blue, pink, whatever. You can hear mid-tone, high-tone. You know, that's, you close your eyes, you can see color. Close your ears, you can hear sound. That's kind of what I look at. And so I look at it with all these different aspects, and it's a bit complex, but that's kind of what I like. Yeah. And then I can take those, and again, yeah, make a cool piece of music, I guess. I guess maybe because I always wanted to be a musician, and I never was, and I'm kind of like, why didn't I learn how to play guitar? <laughs> so I'll try to play it through wine. Wow, well, yeah, you've made a success doing that. You're a very popular uh, wine musician. I still want to learn how to play guitar, but we'll see. Maybe the tambourine. you got plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. 
I love his comparison to music, and I think he's, you know, right on. Michael Brown of Cirque, and now Chev. The Pinot Noir and Chardonnay will be made in a similar style to Cirque, without the far-reaching price, a little more affordable. Michael loves to experiment with the right tones for his wine, as he explained in the last segment. Aside from the vineyards and grapes, for both brands, his instruments include specialized concrete tanks, terracotta amphora from Petaluma, stainless steel barrels and cigar-shaped wood barrels, and concrete eggs from France for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fermentation and aging. So expect Chev to have the same balance and exceptional quality that he's delivered for his Cirque brand. For Chev, as he did with Cirque, he's putting a lot of time and effort into the branding. There are some very detailed elements. And I just talked to Chuck House, who's our label designer, today. I talked to him this morning. And we're working on the uh, the 19 label. And um, I can't wait to see what he comes up with because he's brilliant. I started thinking about high-end craftsmanship in cars because I love cars. And um, I'm like, well, GMC is not going to work. Chevrolet, mm, that's a tough one. Chevy, sounds like a Mexican restaurant where, right. where I used to work, you know. And uh, then I said, Chev, that's kind of cool. Four letters, kind of like Cirque. Right. Brother and sister, sort of a thing. And then I said, you know, I'm going to try to form a uh, a brand around like 1940s Los Angeles car shops. It's Americana. It's not Detroit. Nothing wrong with Detroit, but that's mass production. But at that period of time in L.A., there were all these car shops making really cool cars whether they're custom or you name it. And I go, okay. And then, so we brought in with Chuck House, our label designer. He, yeah, he actually brought him in. Like 40 different old oil cans from the 30s and 40s. And we we were starting to gain inspiration, Mm -hmm. right? It took us a year on this freaking label. And he went to Sacramento or somewhere, and he just happened to stumble upon like a 1970s Chevrolet pickup truck. He took a photo of the tailgate. Sure. That's where Chev came from, the back of this tailgate. If you notice on the on the label, Jeff, the one in the center with the circle, uh-huh. and I wanted different things. I wanted a circle, I wanted a diamond, and I wanted a square. Well, the square is not really a square. It's a rectangle of the of the label. But if you look in the middle of that circle... Mm -hmm. See that emblem in the middle? Yeah. Well, Chuck House found some steam engine from like 1850s that had an emblem on it. And then he reworked the emblem to say Chef. So if you look at the emblem, it says Chef. I was thinking that was an and sign. No, but the letters, it's C-H-E-V. And then see the diamond? Read what the diamond says on the the left side of that circle. 100% grape wine. Yeah. (laughs) You got to state the obvious. Well, and, and then I, there's another thing. See, see where it says, huh? I love this on the side. Oh, it's a VIN number. You got a VIN number on there. Yeah, and that's uh-huh. like the Appalachian, the vintage, and all these different things. And you see on the very right side, it's a battery. Oh, right. But that's yeah. our with the month and uh, year. You know, of... Yeah, month and year of bottling. Mm-hmm. But that's what you, they do with batteries. And see where it says Chardonnay and Pinot Noir? That yeah. came from an old oil can. So that's a unique font based on a vintage oil can. Gosh, yeah. And then on the upper right, on the uh, government warning, or upper left, Uh you see those little emblems? That's what you do. What does it say? Uh, Pregnant women can't drink. Yeah. It's got the slash through it. Yeah. Don't drink and drive. And don't operate a tractor while drinking. Exactly. (laughs) And so our compliance company said, this will never fly. Never fly. And I go, well, let's see. (laughs) And we sent it in and it flew. We got it approved. That's an appropriate warning. And so on the right side of those emblems, if you look, pour this side up. See that little arrow? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't pour a wine this side up. You got to turn it upside down. That's right. So it's kind of a joke. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then on the back side of the label, the back of the bottle, gas station sign. Yeah. Got the round... So guy anyway, with a sledgehammer and an anvil. And then also which one I love on your website, that guy's hammer and that anvil. It is. And when I was in the circus, when we were driving stakes in to like do the trapeze or the high wire, there'd be three of us around one stake. And we would time it. Sixteen pound sledgehammers. 
you do a full swing, boom, the next guy, boom, the next guy, boom, 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 boom. You know, you swing yeah. this thing, but you got to be in rhythm. You mm -hmm. got to be in balance. And that was one of my favorite things in the circus was to drive stakes. Wow. And that's why I wanted that here. And another a little tidbit, and then I'll, I'll shut up about this packaging. <laughs> but if you look at this, um, look at both labels, okay? All right. And look at the signature. Uh huh. See how they're slightly different? They are. So there's three pieces on this. Every 12 bottles is different. The signature, every 12 bottles changes. <laughs> and also on the bottom, see how it says um, V2018? 2018, yeah. That's like 20 odd 18. It's like oil. Right, right. But those change a little uh, slightly too. And the, no, the, the little imprints on the battery kind of thing, mm -hmm. each one changes as well. It's very subtle. And most people will they they don't get it unless you explain it. Well, but yeah, that's absolutely. a hidden gem, you know. Definitely, it's it's such minute detail. Minute detail. Which, I mean, nobody's gonna even know about it until you tell them about it. They're gonna go, what? <laughs> so most people don't know the minute detail that goes into the incredible, exceptional wine that you're making. That's part of it, yes. It's representing that detail. Absolutely. And that's the thing. And and the goal here is, with Chev and with Cirque, is to, again, like I said earlier, to provide somebody with a very delicious beverage. That's kind of it. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, you make it sound so but, simple. But then we can have fun with different elements. Yeah, why not? And then when we're in person with somebody, it's like, check this out. <laughs> this is kind of what this means. And it's just, it's it's fun. It's creative. But it also has a grasp on marketing. And people will then go out and tell that story. Because we're a very small staff. So I got to rely on people out there, consumers and all around yeah. the country and the world or whatever that then they're going to tell that story. And people love sharing that kind of stuff. They love sharing it, that stuff. It shows that they're in the know. And and I'm not pushing it hard. It's just like, you want to hear a story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to hear a story? Kind of like the, the book thing. I got all kinds of stories with that. So now you're in the know. He is crazy detailed. When Michael was showing me around his winery, for the second time since he's been updating quite a bit lately, he started talking about that book thing. I wanted to catch the details, so I started recording in his small makeshift conference room. So you'll notice this part has lower quality sound. You won't believe who's narrating this book that he was prompted to write. It's called Pino Rocks, and it took Michael four years to put his thoughts down. The writer who was helping him at one point had to say, Give it up, man. The book is good. And he goes, we're going to do hardback, paperback, audiobook. And I go, okay. And so it's all coming out November 10th. And then he goes, um, I talked to one of his gals and he, and she said, uh, we've got seven narrators for your audiobook out of LA. They're professionals. You can choose whichever one you want. Wow. And I go, okay. And then that night, midnight, I'm up in bed and I'm going, there's two people I would like to narrate this book. Morgan Freeman or William Shatner. Can't go wrong with either of those guys. And Morgan Freeman would take some serious political capital. <laughs> I've got a connection with him, but I would have to navigate. But William Shatner, one of my good buddies in the radio business in L.A., is one of the best friends of William Shatner. So I just lobbed a softball out in left field. This is like a month and a half ago. And I, I said, do you think uh, Mr. Shatner would be willing to narrate my book? He goes, I don't know. I'll give him a call. <laughs> a week later, I'm on the phone with Captain Kirk. And nice. he goes, I love the manuscript. I would love to do it. You know? Great. And he uh, he did it. And he nailed it. Oh, so that's drama with his reading. Totally. And the guy ad-libbed here and there. Oh, yeah? And I'm like, you got to be freaking kidding me. I, is that allowed by narrators to ad-lib? 
Well, I don't know the game, but you it worked. So. You know, yeah. it worked. That was great. Um, so that's the deal. And and again, really, the book is about again uh, my upbringing, and I had some some issues in my early life. Nothing, no abusive stuff or nothing like that. It was just trying to navigate. You know. Mm-hmm. And I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be a craftsman, and I was in a restaurant business. And then uh, I wanted to be a winemaker. And I did that, and. You know, my family, my wife, my kids, and I, they're, they're awesome. And um, and then this whole Costa Brown thing, and and it gets into, at the end, it gets into the American dream. Sure. And it gets into what you don't want to do in the wine business, from my perspective. And it's that whole kind of, it's a whole story. And it gets into all these different aspects. You know, me blowing myself up with black powder and things like that. There's some funny stories in there too. But it's all true. It's all true. And um, um, it was really kind of hard actually because I had to come to terms with sharing my story. Yeah, it was really bizarre because I've got, and then when I listen to it, I'm like, oh God, right? Okay. And it's not detrimental. It's just, um, it was just a process of going, here's what happened and here's my life up to this point. And not all the stories. I got a lot of other stories that I didn't share. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's book two. It is. Yeah. (laughs) But it was a really, it was a really cool project and it's coming out, man. And I told this guy, Tucker Max, I told him the writer, I said, I don't need to sell a million books. That's not my motivation. Right. I want to give my kids a book. That's kind of it. And how cool is that? Very. You know, how many parents get to do that? I think all parents should put down details of their life that they never got around to telling their kids. I wish my dad did. Michael Brown. Both Brown family wines are distributed by an allocation list. You have to sign up to be a member. If the list is full, you'll be sent to a waiting list. So if you want a taste to what Michael is creating now, who in the past, along with his partner Dan at Costa Brown, which had people waiting for more than a year to move on from the waiting list, sign up now. Find his wines at Cirque.com, C-I-R-Q.com, and ChevWines.com, C-H-E-V, Wines.com. A big thanks to Michael for spending a couple of hours with me. And a couple of bottles. Yeah, I like the perks. That wraps up this podcast. Thanks for hanging with us. As always, this podcast was adapted from my radio show and was researched, written, and produced by me. Find more interviews at onthewineroad.us. I'm also on Instagram at jdwineroad. Stay well, be kind to one another, and I hope to come across you soon on The Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis. 